My name is Rabbi Daniel Lehman, President of Hebrew College. And as the representative of Hebrew College, Andover Newton's neighbor and partner, I would like to begin this inauguration ceremony with a recitation of Psalm 148, first in the original Hebrew, followed by an English adaptation that was specially composed for this occasion. Hallelujah, Hallelujah to Adonai Min Hashemayim, Hallelujah Mabromim, Hallelujah Chom Belachav, Hallelujah Chol Sevahav, Hallelujah Shem Hashemayim, Hallelujah Chol Koch Veor, Hallelujah Shem Hashemayim, Hamayim Hashemayim Hashemayim, and Hallelujah Shem Adonai, Ki Hu Siva Benitraum, and Amirei Malad Olam.
you please pray with me? Rock of ages, cleave for us. Gather us under your wings of grace. For if you are not here, our words are in vain. We need you, God. Oh, how we need you. Every hour we need you. Sometimes, oh God, we sit high as a city on a hill. Sometimes we need to be gathered as chicks. So we thank you, God, that even as you gather us, you lift us up. And even as we are lifted up, we are gathered in. Lord, you are faithful. So be faithful again. Blow through these doors. Turn our words into worship. Turn our songs into praise. Till our hearts so that they might receive the seeds of your grace. Oh Lord, bless this time. Bless this inauguration. Bless Martin Copenhaver. And bless all who bear the name of Andover Newton. This we pray in the name of God. Amen. Sisters and brothers, if you seek to live a life of meaning and purpose, then welcome to Old South Church, for that is our guiding star, though God knows we rarely get it right. If you seek to live in love and peace with all God's children and all God's good creation, then welcome to Old South Church, for such is our high ambition, though it is far from us and we have not arrived. If you like stories with surprise endings, then welcome to Old South Church. For we are privy to the greatest story ever told with an ending so insanely amazing, you almost can't believe it. If it is your heart's delight to linger in the house of God, to swim in the rich mythopoeic depths of the stories of Genesis, to get hopelessly and wondrously entangled in the letters of Paul, to hang out with Martha and the Marys, and even to endure scolding by the likes of Amos and Jeremiah, then welcome. Welcome presidents and professors, pastors and poets, choristers and corporators, chaplains and deans. Welcome alums and trustees, students and laity. Welcome to this hour, to this inaugural hour, as we gather round a school deeply rooted in the Christian faith and radically open to what God is doing now. A school whose purpose is meaning, whose syllabus is love incarnate and peace upon all the earth. A school whose treasure is the greatest story ever told. So welcome to this hour, this inaugural hour, as we gather around Andover Newton Theological School that by our earnest prayers and honest praise, we make glad the heart of God. Amen. God's word speaks to us this day from Psalm 27. You are my light and my hope. Whom shall I fear? You are the strength of my life. Before whom shall I tremble? When the wrongful approach to devour my flesh, my oppressors and enemies, it is they who stumble and fall. If an encampment pitches tents against me, my heart will not quiver. One thing I have asked from you, 
one thing I seek, to dwell in your house all the days of my life. <laughs> to behold your beauty, to enter your innermost sanctum. For you cover me with the tabernacle of your presence. On the days when hardship comes, you shield me in the concealment of your tent. Upon a rock, you lift me high from harm. Teach me, O oh source of joy, your ways, and lead me down the level plain, because dangers surround me on every side. Mm -hmm. Don't give me over to the breath of my fears. O oh, mortal, keep your faith in God. Strengthen your heart and sturdy it. Keep your hope in God.
with thanksgiving, we follow that with the words from Paul in the letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 22 through 28. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that the very Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Here ends the reading. Standing here at a communion table helps us to ground in ourselves and our roots in our Baptist heritage, blessing our renewal of covenant in the words that we will share between us. And that we renew our covenant in this larger UCC church honors our congregational roots as well. For it's important as we take on new things that we remember our roots, honor our shared humanity, as we aspire to be open to the work of God in the world today. We know American faith communities are in the midst of one of the faith's largest cultural revolutions we're told in 500 years. So this is no time for merely pro forma inaugural questions or simply carrying out ancient traditions. You can't get the same answer they gave 100 years ago. <laughs> so I ask you to search your heart deeply in answering these three questions. First, our new mission statement calls us to reaffirm that we are deeply rooted in Christian faith and radically open to what God is doing now. How will this mission statement help shape your presidency beginning here in the second decade of the 21st century? I celebrate our rootedness in Christian faith, roots that are very deep, 207 years deep. I honor the proud history of Andover Newton. I celebrate the rich tradition of our school. At such a time as this, however, we must draw upon the ways our history points us to the future. Our history is one of innovation. We have a tradition of being responsive to the unique challenges of each new era. So I promise to be radically open to what God is doing now. Not just in some general abstract way. Rather, I will be radically open day by day in every setting, in every plan, in every decision. Second, 20th century Christianity often theologically found itself dividing the world into sinners and saints, wheat and chaff, and then set about trying to separate one from the other. Today, we are willingly recognize that we are all deeply human, which is to say we all have deep flaws, and all will ultimately fall short of our aspirations. So we enter into covenant together, being clear about what we owe to each other and how we will be held accountable for our acts. Yet when we fall short, ready to forgive a contrite heart and begin a process of healing and reconciliation. So what kind of covenantal agreement do you offer our school as part of your presidency? I believe in the gospel, that I am a beloved child of God, 
not based on my goodness, but on God's grace. It is because I am deeply human and deeply flawed that I rely on God's grace. I believe that God's redemptive love has the power to transform my life in ways that more fully reflect the still more excellent way of Jesus. It is with those convictions and in that spirit that I join in this covenant. So here's the third question. We're told by the Association of Theological Schools that the majority of seminaries and theological schools in America may not be here in 30 years. We believe Andover Newton has a place in God's work in the world. So what will you do as president to help us discern and to live into God's work for Andover Newton well into our third century as a school of the church? I come with an open heart, responsive to the Spirit's leading. I will be tireless in my work, unstinting in my devotion, and faithful in my prayers for Andover Newton. I will not shrink from facing hard realities and making difficult decisions. I will bring whatever I have in the way of faith, vision, creativity, joy, wisdom, and spirit of collaboration to this role. I will be an enthusiastic ambassador for our school in Newton Center, in the Boston area, in New England, in this country, and beyond. Wherever there is anyone who might be willing to hear our story, or better yet, to take part in our story. Having heard your responses, I now ask you, do you promise to devote yourself to the responsibilities of this office, leading this community as a good steward of all its gifts and graces, and administering the responsibilities entrusted to you with integrity, faithfulness, vision, and imagination? I do with the help of God. I want to ask the whole congregation, as you're willing, to stand and join in and, and support so will you, as a congregation, and all those including in this, the ones who are not here present, join me in promising our prayers, our support, our faithfulness to this common work, striving together to follow in God's way of servant leadership, recognizing that we can do together what no one of us can do alone. If so, please say, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. With the help of God, all things are possible. Please be seated. And I invite uh, Nick Carter, uh, President Emeritus, to come and add his words to mine. Martin, it is my privilege to pass on to you this presidential medallion. It is shining and weighty. A necklace that symbolizes the precious burden of the presidential office. Over the ten generations of this great school's existence, each of us who has worn this medallion has come to know the sacred and humbling lessons of what it means to be chosen for this responsibility. As you assume it now, I pray that this wonderful community will lighten your load, make your path clear, and bless you as they have done to me. Amen. Let the people say amen. amen. Let us pray for Martin, child of God, as he assumes the responsibility and privilege of the Andover Newton Theological School Presidency. Holy God, we ask for your blessing on Martin as he receives this mantle and commits himself to service as the president of this school, its faculty, trustees, administration, students, staff, alumni, alumnae, and friends. He will need your strength, God, 
to center this community on its mission and bravely lead us in our discernment of pathways into the future. Martin will need the patience that comes from you when nothing worth doing can be done quickly. And he'll need the impatience that also comes from you when waiting and seeing aren't possible or aren't wise. We give you thanks for the presidents of Andover Newton's past, especially President Emeritus Nick Carter, who set the stage for this school's flourishing. And we thank you that Martin is surrounded by a cloud of witnesses from across the country and across the generations. He enters a conversation about what our ministry is and needs to be that began before he was born and will continue on for generations to come. God, we know that the role of president comes with a heavy burden. Our institution is complex. Our culture is shifting seismically. And the very communities our graduates serve have needs of our graduates that we are only beginning to understand. To look to a president as the answer to all of our questions and the solution to all of our anxieties, God, is an impossible burden. May our school hold Martin to the highest of standards while also holding him in recognizing that Andover Newton is not a president or any other individual. It's a beloved community where we share together the responsibility and the honor of seeking to interpret what God is doing in our world right now. Hear our prayers, O oh God, for Martin, our president. O oh God, how extraordinarily blessed and honored we are to gather in this sacred place of yours to celebrate your servant, Martin, and his deepening his ministry unto you. We acknowledge you, O oh Lord, as the sole discharger of all divine calls the only one who ordains the very purpose for each of our lives. As you have made it so known to Jeremiah, may Martin now ascend to an awareness that you have indeed long imagined, set aside, and established this hour, this very day, and this season of his life even before he was formed in his mother's womb. We pray that the Martin you have nurtured and have shaped along his years will be the very Martin prepared now to assume the presidency of Andover Newton Theological School. May all the gifts that you have so abundantly stored in him, his family lineage, of preaching servants, his father's irreplaceable influence, his own faith, his wife and their two children, his love for people, his second nature to always lead, his laughter and joy and wit. May Martin leave none of these gifts behind. But as he crosses over this threshold to this new space unknown to him, help him to always hold on to these gifts ever so tightly as reminders of your grace. Lord, assure Martin, your child and servant, that you have not brought him this far to leave him, but to walk with him even closer. As he takes on the unfathomable challenges of his new ministry in his days ahead, plant within him greater humility and yet more resolve to endure still the struggles of his humanity, the steadfastness to honor you, and the striving to become more holy. 
Hear our prayers, O God, for Martin as your servant. We now ask you, God, to bless Martin in his pastoral ministry in his new role as seminary president. Renew his heart and his strength to lovingly under-shepherd this community of students and scholars, learners and leaders, dreamers, and yes, doers of your word. In our chapel and in the wider community with our constituents, may he preach and administer the sacraments with faithfulness and in truth. Release onto him a new anointing, new preaching power, and a new passion for not only taking custodianship of a school, but a new zeal to tenderly care for the souls of each faith sojourner of this seminary. May he embrace the Andover Newton community as his own, the place where God has called him to serve at this moment in his ministry journey. And use him in all his days at Andover Newton as your servant to help draw us nearer to your perfect will. Amen. Amen. So um, in my house I make the waffles. Um, they're hard to make uh, because waffles have to be crispy on the outside and oh so fluffy on the inside. It's really about the eggs though. It's all about the eggs. You, you, you crack the eggs and then you know how you do it. You kind of pull them apart and then you slip back and forth and separate the white from the yolk back and forth just like this back and forth and, the, and that slippery white stuff slips down into the bowl and you preserve the yolk and then you drop the yolk over here and then you stir those whites up until they're so stiff and then you whip up the yolks. What, what strikes me about this whole process is it really is about the eggs. It has nothing to do with me. If I get the eggs right, the waffles are right. It, it also strikes me the way the egg is. You know, it's amazingly resilient. You go back and forth, you can really do it pretty well. I've gotten down to it three, by the time I've done the three eggs for my waffles, I'm just going back and forth, incredibly resilient. And yet, if the shell nicks the yolk, it falls apart. Stunningly resilient and frighteningly fragile. Martin, I'm going to give you a gift now that uh, I'm bringing on behalf of the seminaries of the United Church of Christ and the Association of Theological Schools, uh, some 270 theological schools, and every single one of them are stunningly resilient and frighteningly fragile. But they're incredible places. And I give you this egg to hang somewhere or to put somewhere or to do something with to remember that frankly it's not all about you, it's about the eggs. It's, it's really about getting that thing right to make the school just right and it will do fine. But you'll work hard, but it's stunningly resilient and frighteningly fragile. Good afternoon. <laughs> President Copenhaver, I have for you a gift on behalf of the Alumni Association, a stole that was gifted to me, that I am gifting, we are gifting to you. And we ask with this gift that you remember the heritage of our alumni, not only those of the past, but those of the present. And that with that heritage, there is not only a remembrance and a cherishing, but also a celebration. And with that celebration, reminding us through your presidency that when we graduate, we are only at the very beginning. That our lives continue on far more than that last day that we see each other in that class and step into whatever call God has called us to be in. May we be reminded that we can come back to the hill at any time 
to be refreshed and refurbished so that we can go forward in our ministries. Blessings. President Copenhaver, I would like to present you with a prayer so that we may hold you in community as you will hold the students in community. If everyone would join me in prayer. God, we are gathered here together, all of us students, still learning how to be in this world, still learning what it means to be people of faith. Oh God, I am here as a representative of the students of Andover Newton, those who are struggling and those who are willing to move forward during this transitional time. I ask that you hold all students in your healing embrace. President Copenhaver, loved by you as one of your children, is entering a new role in our community. We ask you to bestow upon him courage, like the courage you give students to move forward toward their call, no matter the obstacles. We ask you to give him guidance, like the guidance you give students, so he may discern which obstacles can be overcome through study and time, and which can only be overcome through prayer and love. We ask that you embrace the Reverend Martin, his family, and the Andover Newton community in your love. Oh God, we are still learning about each other. We ask for comfort as trust is found and trust is rebuilt. We ask that as president, the Reverend Martin will be an example of justice, faithfulness, and joy. We ask that as students, we will be an example of sacred hospitality. We ask you to continue to bless our school and our community. God, we pray in the name of the one who died so that we may live, who was shamed so that we could be made whole. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Please be seated. Where is he? Martin. Uh, today, with ceremony and song, we inaugurated you as president of a theological school. But as we are assembled here, the world is in flames. Out there, innocent people suffer unspeakably. Refugees flee from bad things to worse. Bombs put an end to futures. Viruses ravage nations, politicians posture. Protesting crowds are dispersed by gas and dogs. And out there, there's at least one out of work blue collar relative of mine who over his beer is looking at what we're doing here and thinking big freaking deal. We have affirmed you as president of a theological school, a venerable one, sure. That's something. But you can see how some people might find this ridiculous, or at least out of touch, maybe irrelevant. How does this matter? How is this necessary? What possible difference does this make? Now there are days we ask ourselves that too, we who make our living in such places as the one you now lead. And yet here we are, and here you are, as if it does matter, as if it is necessary, as if it will make a difference. And it does, because what we have here is a calling from God, yours. You heard it, and you said so, and this community has confirmed it. You could be picketing, you could be politicking, you could be on the front lines feeding the hungry, you could be engaged in all kinds of world-challenging, world-changing activities, and not this. But you are a president. And being a president is what you are called to do. And because it is yours to do, it's the most necessary thing in the world. And in some mysterious way, as Virginia Woolf said in defense of writing, it's more necessary than anything else. And so I charge you, devote yourself to your calling. Devote yourself to being a president with the kind of devotion artists bring to art, worshipers bring to adoration, and singers bring to song. Persist devotedly in the thousand tasks that make up this work. And by devotedly, I mean attending daily not only to what you know and what you know how to do, but also to what you do not know how to do, what you do not know, what you may never know, what you may never master. Devote yourself to what Stephanie Paulsell has referred to as the unknowable more of your calling. Its lure is the engine of imagination and great deeds. But you can know it, approach it, it reveals itself only by way of devotion, only by showing up every day, only by diligently taking up where you left off the day before, which will often be at the beginning that you thought you had left behind, because you never really leave the beginning. Because it so happens, the more we devote ourselves to our calling, the more our familiarity with it deepens and the more it recedes from view. The more we devote ourselves, the more comfortably we move around its 
spacious rooms, and the more we can't even find a key to open the door. The more we advance, the more we have to start again. That is how devotion teaches humility, and how humility makes us wise. So devote yourself, show up, practice the scales, repeat the steps, fill the sketchbook, bend your knees again and again, be devoted, for the world is in flames, and out there the innocent suffer, refugees flee, bombs fall, Viruses ravage, politicians splutter. Crowds are dispersed, and my blue-collar, out-of-work relative is still objecting to this over his beer. You received a calling, and despite what that relative thinks, your devotion to it makes a difference out in that world to all those people and to all of us. Because it is a calling, because it's yours to do, it is the most necessary thing in the world, more necessary than anything else. So Martin, do not take on the presidency of Andover Newton because you know you can do it. Please take it on because you must do it and devote yourself. Devote yourself like an artist to art a worshiper to adoration, a singer to song, knowing that you have what it takes and you have nothing at all. Do it with gifts that are amply adequate to the job and with humility that shows you your limits and tells you you would be wise to reverence them. Knowing that you can do this job is not a source of confidence for us. Knowing that you are devoted to doing it is. Devote yourself, my charge to you, in truth and love.
Just the other day, I heard a man say that he did not believe in God's word. But I can truly say the Lord has made a way and he never, he never failed me yet. Reverend Dr. Nancy Taylor and members of Old South Church, thank you for hosting us so graciously today. President Emeritus Carter, as you blessed Andover Newton for 10 years as president, you bless our gathering here by your presence here today. Thank you. Reverend Dr. James Sherblum and Reverend Judy Swanberg and all of your fellow trustees, I continue to be grateful for and inspired by your servant leadership. Thank you. Dean Sarah Drummond, you are such a gift to this school. Thank you for your leadership each day and today. Professors Robert Pasmino and Jennifer Peace and Adam Hurlson, 
and the rest of our esteemed faculty, the very core of what we do, and you do so magnificently. Thank you. Reverend Amelia Halstead, you represent the alumni and the alumnae of whom we are so very proud. Thank you. Ms. Casey Gay, you are a true leader among our wonderful students. Thank you for your leadership today. Members of this amazing Andover Newton staff, quite simply, you are the best. Thank you. President Daniel Lehman, we are blessed by the life-giving relationship between our schools to such an extent that we cannot imagine our school without your school. Thank you. President David Greenhaw of Eden Seminary, your exemplary leadership of Eden for 18 years as president is an inspiration. Thank you. Reverend Dr. Mary Ludy, Mr. David Carrier, and other beloved, beloved members and friends of Village Church, your presence here today means more than I can say. Thank you. Reverend Dr. Gregory Groover, Mr. Tyrone Sutton, and members of Charles Street African Methodist Episcopal Church. Your friendship and partnership in the gospel means the world to me. Thank you. <laughs> Delegates from other institutions of higher learning, these proceedings are greatly enriched by your presence. Thank you. Members of my family, both here and cheering us on from afar. My love and gratitude for you knows no bounds. Friends of Andover Newton, all the children of God gathered here, thank you, one and all. My heart is full of gratitude. When I was given the great privilege of becoming president of Andover Newton Theological School, I said that I looked forward to bringing all of my gifts, experience, faith, and dedication to the task. That is still true. In fact, more true now than ever. But today, I would add that I also come with my heart in my hands. Henry Nowen, who was one of my professors in Divinity School, wrote, the more I think about the meaning of living and acting in the name of Christ, the more I realize that what I have to offer to others is not my intelligence, skill, power, influence, or connections, but my own human brokenness through which the love of God can manifest itself. The celebrant in Leonard Bernstein's Mass says, Glass shines brighter when it's broken. I never noticed that. I've always believed that to be true. The love of God can be manifest in human brokenness. Now it is a truth to which I hold dear. I have always believed in a God of redemption. Now I hold that belief very close. I take solace in knowing that our God has a peculiar and persistent way 
of working through flawed people. When Karen's and my children, Alana and Todd, were very young, someone gave us a bib that said, please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. Does anyone have a bib like that at home that you could lend me for a while? Because I'm counting on the promise that God isn't finished with me yet. That is, I rely. <laughs> Amen. I rely on the gift of hope. Adam Hurlson. Hopefully he's getting a little nervous now being called out in that way. Our, our brilliant assistant professor of preaching and worship and director of Wilson Chapel recently observed that hope binds itself quite readily to many different emotions and circumstances. Hope is like hydrogen, he said. An element that loves to bind with other elements. I've pondered Adam's observation ever since. Although I don't know much about the properties of hydrogen, I do know it's true of hope. And that's a good thing. Particularly on a day like today, because it means that hope can bind itself to whatever you brought with you. If you brought a lament today, hope can join you. If you brought a spirit of thanksgiving, that spirit can be partnered with hope. If you brought with you sadness or joy or confusion or compassion or concern or love or determination, hope can bind itself to that. That is to say, hope can bind itself to you. You can live by hope. To live by hope is to lean toward the future knowing that what we most need is not yet with us. A plant that is confined indoors will lean toward the window to be closer to that which gives life even though it has never seen the sun. The same is true of us when we live by hope. We lean toward the future in hope because we, what we most need is just out of sight. Because to do otherwise is to wither and die. And hope is not some last desperate grasping. It is full of confidence. If faith is that by which we trust that God has been and is at work in the world and in our own lives, then hope is trust that God isn't finished with the world yet and isn't finished with any of us yet. Hope is the expectation that if God was the God of the past and is the God of the present, surely God will be the God of the future. Hope is the confidence that God has not written the last chapter. There are untold and unimagined wonders yet to be performed. And because the last chapter has not been written, hope refuses to close the book. Hope is often confused with optimism. But see how different they are. An optimist tends to think that given time, things will work out. That given a chance, people will do the right thing. That in all things, nothing is as bad as it seems. Optimists believe in people and point easily to the many positive forces at work in the world. A realist, or the realist in us, 
may be quick to correct the optimist view of the world by noting that if given a chance, people do not always do what they should do or what we would like. The realist will catalog our per proven potential for hurting one another, for making a tangled mess of our lives, for greed in the face of need, for indifference in the presence of hardship. And here's where hope and optimism diverge. A person of hope can share a realist view of the world and still have an optimist's confidence that what we most need and want is assured. Just beyond view. The reason is this. A person of hope may have seen too much to find the reasons for confidence in the world or in other people or in one's own self. But for the person of hope, that assessment does not lead to pessimism or despair because the confidence of a person of hope is not based on what we see in the world or in one another or in our own selves. Rather, hope is based on the unseen reality of God. The person of hope is the ultimate realist because in addition to seeing hard reality, such a person also sees the ultimate reality, and that is God. Hope is looking at all the reasons for discouragement straight in the eye and saying in a confidence given by nothing less than the power of the Holy Spirit, nonetheless. Nonetheless. Think of Paul. He was a man of hope, but he was not an optimist. Unlike the optimist, Paul held a rather dim assessment of the world around him. He heard the cries of sorrow and despair and said that it was as if the whole world was in the pain and travail of childbirth. There is pain now, surely. Nonetheless, the very cries of pain signal a new life, as yet unseen and only dimly imagined. The reason for that hope cannot be seen because the reason for that hope is God. I was once asked to summarize the Christian gospel in seven words or less. My response was this, God gets the last word. I figured I would save the two additional words for another occasion when I really <laughs> needed them. God gets the last word. If given more than five words, I would say this, our God is the kind of God who insists on having the last word. To be sure, the second to last word, which can be very powerful, can be given to something else, despair, estrangement, hurt, disease, evil, even death itself. But our God is the kind of God who insists on having the very last word. And that's always a word of encouragement, of reconciliation, of healing, of goodness, and of life. That is, God's last word is a word of hope. And that is why I have said that in regard to the life of the mainline church today, I am weary of the narrative of decline. It is true that in many settings of the church there are fewer people and fewer dollars I have seen the statistics. I don't doubt them. But is that to be the story of our time? No. God
God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. We need to figure out what it is and get with the program. In most settings, the church of the future will look different from what it looks like today. Does anyone doubt that? But that is not reason for despair. It is an occasion for us to respond with the boldness that is inspired by hope. Benjamin Franklin said, if you're done changing, you're done. Well, God is not done with Andover Newton yet. There is such important work left for us to do, so we remain open, radically open to what God is doing now. That phrase comes from our new mission statement. Deeply rooted in Christian faith, radically open to what God is doing now, Andover Newton educates inspiring leaders for the 21st century. The phrase deeply rooted and radically open has already been embraced as a kind of shorthand way of describing who we are and what our mission is. By the way, on the Andrew Newton campus, we have five resident wild turkeys. We've not yet been successful in enrolling them in any classes, but they are very much a part of our community. Don't mess with those turkeys. In fact, uh, they're so much a part of us that, that uh, they've been given names. One is known as Deeply. Another is called Rooted. The others are and radically open. Those turkeys are a living, strutting reminder of the scope of our mission. We are deeply rooted in Christian faith, and I mean deeply. 207 years of rootedness. And because we are people of hope, we are radically open to what God is doing now. The church of the future will look different than it does today. It seems clear that God is doing something new. But God is not done with the church yet. And so God is not done with Andover Newton yet. One of our current students recently said something like this to a faculty member. I have a terrible problem. I'm experiencing a sense of call to ministry. In a congregational setting. And I blame Andover Newton. I came to Andrew Newton persuaded that the church was dead. I spent the whole year seeking some kind of confirmation of that conclusion. Instead, I keep feeling this sense of pull toward the new life <laughs> that everyone at Andover Newton is talking about. That says so much about who we are as a school. It's clear about the realities of our time but is steeped in hope. Our world needs people like the students and graduates of Andover Newton. There's an urgent need for people of faith who can recognize God's image in the person who is not in their own image. And who will be capable of that in our time? Who will be able to recognize God's image in the one who is not in my own image? It will not be the religious extremists who are ready to exclude anyone who does not agree with them. It will not be those who, to use Jonathan Swift's acid phrase, have just enough religion to make us hate one another, but not enough to make us love one another. And the secularists will not be of much help in this new era either. 
those who hold thoroughly secular worldviews do not appreciate religious conviction and so are strangely ill-equipped to deal with many of the central issues of our day, so many of which have important religious dimensions. Much the same could be said of those who hold their religious convictions lightly. This is not their time either. Because those whose faith, because they're not particularly equipped, rather, to relate to those whose faith is central to their very existence. So this is not the time for those who hold their religious convictions lightly. Today, something more is required. This is a time for people who have deep religious commitments and thus can appreciate the commitments of others. What is urgently needed in our complex, interconnected world are people of faith who, the more deeply they hold their own religious commitments, the more room they make room for those not like them. At Andover Newton, that is the sort of people we aim to be. People who, the more deeply we hold our religious commitments, the more room we make for those not like us. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who was chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of Great Britain, tells of going to see a Jewish mystic who told him this parable. Imagine two people who spend their lives transporting stones. One carries bags of diamonds, the other hauls sacks of rocks. Each is now asked to take a consignment of rubies. Which of the two understands what he is now carrying? The man who's used to diamonds knows that stones can be precious, even those that are not diamonds. But the one who has carried only rocks think the stones are a mere burden. They have weight, but not worth. Rubies are beyond his comprehension. So it is, he said, with faith. If we cherish our own, then we will understand the value of others. We may regard ours as a diamond and another faith as a ruby, but we know that both are precious stones. Understanding the particularity of what matters to us is the best way of coming to appreciate what matters to others. This is what is needed in our time. People who have mined the best of their religious traditions for the riches they contain. We need people who are used to carrying diamonds and so know something about the value of rubies. And it is an urgent need. It's a need for us to fulfill our mission to be both deeply rooted and radically open. And we will. We must. As a pastor, I would often read in op-ed pages or here at cocktail parties this kind of sentiment. I would be a member of a church if only there were a church that was not judgmental, that didn't act like they have an exclusive franchise on the truth, that was open to people of other traditions, other religions, an inclusive community that truly welcomes people regardless of sexual orientation, 
that's committed to social justice and the urgent issues of our time. If there were a church like that, I'd be the first to sign up. And I'm going, hello, hello, over here, we're over here. But you know, Andover Newton has much the same problem. Many people don't know that a school like ours exists. An inclusive community that embraces diversity, racial and ethnic diversity, and also the diversity of faith traditions. A school where academic rigor is expected, but also recognizes that you don't learn in a classroom everything you need to be a religious leader. A school where interfaith understanding and relationships are not just things we do, but are central to who we are. A school where all are expected to think deeply, but not all are expected to think alike. A school where people truly care about one another and seek to be part of the beloved community. A school where folks of the LGBTQ community are not only welcomed, but cherished. A school that is committed to social justice and to addressing the urgent needs of our time. An old school that does not shrink from the understanding that God is doing something new. If only there were a school like that! Well, there is. <laughs> we are that school. Jesus said, a city on a hill cannot be hid. But a school on a hill? <laughs> well, sometimes our light is hidden. More people need to know that a school like Andover Newton exists. We are the school many people have been waiting for. They just don't know that we're already here. These days, sometimes, you can feel like the very ground on which we have stood for generations is shifting. And even slipping out from under our feet. Ministry used to be a vocation of low stress and high prestige. Now it's a vocation of high stress and low prestige. Which it seems to me means we're kind of back on track. After all, as a Christian, I follow a crucified Savior. Why should I expect to have low stress and high prestige? Martin Luther, depressed with the state of the church and the state of his life, he used to mope around the house day in and day out. Martin Luther's wife started wearing black. When Martin finally asked why, she replied, Oh, haven't you heard? God is dead. Well, God is not dead. God is doing a new thing. And Andover Newton is not dead. Not by a long shot. Because God is doing a new thing with us as well. So we are full of hope. Much good and important work remains to be done. I aim to give it my all. But that is not why I'm confident. Rather, I am confident because I believe in the God who gives us the gift of hope. And God is good. God is good. All the time. God is good.
all the time. And that is our hope. As we sing this uh, final hymn, this is a, a wonderful Welsh hymn. And I gather that Welsh choir masters would wait for heartfelt singing to fully inform the singing of the hymn. So if we get to that last phrase, if the choir master is insufficiently impressed with the passion and vigor with which it was sung, it would sing that phrase again. And if it still wasn't adequate, sing that phrase again. Until finally the room was filled with the resounding sound of praise. So today I know I've been inaugurated as president, but I'm appointing myself choir master for this purpose uh, today. Please join in the final hymn.
Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleading, pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Yeah, I have to do this in one second.